ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and boys everybody and girls in between. He's your favorite, He's your favorite Mexican American Gemini from South Texas. It's Chibi. And she's the lipstick loving Salvador Rican from Brooklyn, New York. It's Rocky. And this is Words and Shit. The show where you get to know the person behind the poetry. Brought to you by Write Our Out. Rocky! <laughs> Hey, Timmy. Hi. How you doing? I ming we we doing what we can do to get by, right? Yes. You yes. looking mighty fabulous back in your Brooklyn home with your exposed brick and all. Pero on purpose, ¿verdad? Pero on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so they can charge you extra. No, I'm kidding. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we really do. Um, no, it's actually really nice to be home. Um, I think this is going to be the first show that I'm doing in Brooklyn. Um, it only took seven episodes for me to finally be here <laughs> and not jump in my intro. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You manifested it. It came to be, right? It really, really did. It really did. And speaking of manifesting, I'm all, so it's spicy season for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> for those that don't know, apparently everybody knows I'm a Gemini because I mention it every show and it's turning into a drinking game. But for those that don't know, Rocky is a Pisces. So I it am. is your season. <laughs> It is my season and I go like, I go, I'm very extra during my season. Like I celebrate starting February 19th and until March 20th, like we're going, going, going. I'm magical. I'm dreamy. You know, I'm manifesting wonderful things during my season. So um, actually, because starting, I think tomorrow night, we're going to have a full moon, which is meant to manifest stuff. Mm, I need to put that into my calendar to just like put intentions out into the world, right? So, yes. so I can manifest something. Yes, I do. I love like during the full moon, like I really try to center myself, um, try to be very intentional and very honest with myself, right? Mm. Um, I always think about like I, I sage, I like, you know, I make sure to like shower in this like full moon, bask in that energy because um, everything is intentional. Right. Mm. Everything is super intentional. So I know this probably is like your first full moon that like someone's telling you like manifest. What would you manifest for yourself uh, in the next couple of weeks? I mean, it's just is there's so much has happened in the past year mm -hmm. that I feel like saying just peace of mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that something that we need in our lives right now is a little peace of mind. That's definitely what I would just try and put out there, because like with everything that's going on. It's mm -hmm. like I, some, I need some moments of just Zen where I can just breathe and not have to worry about the 73 things that I'm currently worrying about. Right. Because yeah. so much craziness is happening outside the world uh, that's affecting my life. Right. So I would, I would manifest peace of mind. How about you? I know. I, well, for me, I think I am because it's my birthday season too. Right. <laughs> 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 um, that came out very like loose clues. Um, <laughs> um, I am manifesting a lot of love, a lot of mm. love and growth and release of things that no longer serve me purpose, right? Mm. To feel lighter and not carry on that heaviness. Um, but, and like part of that, I always really love to to do is like read poetry that is very intentional and very honest. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think <laughs> our guest, right. I was re-listening to a lot of their, their poetry. Um, and it got me definitely in my feels um, a lot like driver's license to the Gen Z. Gen Z. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this poetry is like equivalent to that, but more. <laughs> um, and I would love, I think we should definitely introduce and bring in our very honest and intentional and amazing um, poet for the night. Go ahead, let's, Jimmy. Let's go ahead and do it. Tonight we are featuring and having a conversation with Rudy Francisco. Rudy Francisco is one of the most recognizable names in spoken word poetry. Uh, he has shared stages with prominent artists such as Gladys Knight, Jordan Sparks, Music Soul Child, and Jill Scott. Ultimately, Rudy's goal is to continue to assist others in harnessing their creativity while cultivating his own. Rudy Francisco is the author of Helium, as well as I'll Fly Away. He is also an individual World Poetry Slam champion, a national Poetry Slam champion, and appeared on NBC's The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the right about, right, 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 right words and shit <laughs> studio. What show am I on? Rudy Francisco. <laughs> 
Because you, know? <laughs> you got a little confused there, you know. Um, that's what happens when you do a lot, you know. You forget which one is which sometimes. What, yeah. What what city am I on? What year is it? What show is it? <laughs> so, thank you so much for having me today. I'm super excited to be here. No, we're definitely excited. Like I'm telling you, I was listening to um, a lot of your poetry and it just kind of reminded me when I first listened to it when I was like 20, when I was 25, so almost like five, six years ago. Um, and it still gives me a lot of butterflies. So it's, I mean, you're, you're a big deal. <laughs> you're kind of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so uh, I guess I'm going to read some poems, right? That's what oh. In a oh. minute. In a oh. minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know. Rui's like, I'm here. Let's like, go. Poetry. I know. You're like, let's go to the words. No, no, no. We're going to learn about the little shit before. Okay. <laughs> um, so, usually, what we do before we, you know, you do your poetry, I like to do a little check in, especially since you're going to be sharing a lot of intimate words, you know, and a lot of intimate moments about yourself. Um, so, as a friend, Ray, I feel like now we're going to be friends here after you share yeah. your words. Um, one question to always start it off is How's your heart today? How's your heart today, this week, this year? Where are you at? Yeah, I'm doing well, you know. Um, you know, it's been a weird year, of course, uh, for pretty much everybody. But um, I'm really taking this time to like, you know, hang out more with like with my mom. Um, you know, hanging out with my dad a little bit more as well. And I think the sort of uh, silver lining of all this is that it sort of reminded us of what what's really important. You know, mm -hmm. that there are a lot of things that we can't you know, that we can't really do right now. And I think we're realizing how how a lot of those things weren't like essential, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To use the phrase of the year, uh, like a lot of those things weren't essential that we were doing. And now like it's sort of, we're sort of, you know, cut down to the bare minimum. And I think we're, a lot of us are realizing that's, re that's really all we need, you know? Um, so yeah, just really, you know, um, being around my family a lot more, you know, mm -hmm. hanging out with my daughter a lot more. My daughter, she's four, she's gonna be five in, in April. Yeah, which is crazy because yeah. she's human now and has opinions, you know what I mean? As well. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, because like typically I would be gone, you know, three weeks out of the month. I'd be gone all of February, mm -hmm. all of April. So um, yeah, with the you know with the everything shut shut down now, you know now I really have time to just like spend around my family, and it's been, yeah. it's been a blessing in disguise. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, lo I love that. I uh, my parents are now in their senior years, <laughs> and so I like made it a point to like okay. Every yeah. four to six weeks, I'm going to, I'm going to go spend a weekend with them. Cause like, besides just like being together, I know there's like shit that needs to get done around the house that they just can't physically do. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, my mom texted me a couple weeks ago. She's like, you said you were going to come every month. January's almost over. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I hear you. Low key guilt trip, mom. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. yeah absolutely. family. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm also age where you know my parents are getting older and they need a lot more assistance you know so so yeah I'm just, you know trying to be there for them you know in ways that i probably wouldn't be able to do if i was traveling yeah so, yeah so, you know, i'm That's... really enjoying that i'm really enjoying that i do miss performing you know in front of people mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know but um but i i, I do really appreciate like around my family a lot more and also i think the virtual space has been really cool to explore right like i, I wonder why it took us so long you know because it it seems like it just kind of makes sense, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> People who don't have access to poetry, um, like being on mm -hmm. Clubhouse and like you know attending like virtual performances here and there, um, it's really awesome to see people from you know and people who live in the middle of nowhere who don't like really have a poetry community in their cities, or people who live in other countries who don't have a poetry community there either, and mm -hmm. then able to engage in the art form in ways that they just didn't have access before. So yeah. I think it's also been a really awesome thing. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a no brainer, and also I think once the world opens back up, I don't think virtual is going away at all. I don't think it is. I think it shouldn't. You know, um, yeah, because I think it's really opened up a whole world for people who didn't have access before, and I think yeah, it just it just makes sense to continue it in some sort of capacity. No, I think that's the word making it accessible, right? Because I feel like sometimes we're not accessible, you know, or it's just too late or, the, yeah. So this is definitely, definitely. People in New York having to deal with hour long traffic, you know, hours of traffic. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And in LA too, LA yeah. traffic is brutal. Um, yeah. I think I think the virtual space has been really awesome to to see. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering what things will sort of look like once, 
you know, we're able to like meet in person and, and do competitions again, just because I just, I, I've seen so many people sort of like transition. It's like doing different things and that's really awesome too. So I think when we come back, like it's going to be like this interesting sort of mixed bag between like people who have been doing it for a while and brand new people who just came in via the virtual space. Cause I know a lot of people, you know, started performing in the virtual space. Like that's mm -hmm. because it was comfortable uh, sort of like transition for them, you know, from not performing at all to like performing in virtual. And, you know, I wonder what the community is going to look like because we're going to have a, a, a new influx of new people who started performing in the virtual space, you know? So I'm just, I'm interested to see what the community is like. Yeah. 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 I think I was listening to uh, either a podcast or maybe a TikTok where it's just like, you know, after the pandemic, while we're trying to normalize it and we're all vaccinated and we do the hurting that we're going to really start this like new renaissance right so i would definitely see this renaissance of like mixing virtual with real life right and kind of like what kind of what kind of um fashion art you know um literature is going to be out there with this new renaissance right definitely. so i think that's definitely what you're speaking about Mm -hmm. And if you're watching at home right now and you have some opinions, you know, drop them in the comment section, y'all. We you you're part of this conversation, audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so before we get into the poetry, we are going to open up with a little uh, segment we like to call speed dating. Mm -hmm. So we're going to ask you a series of questions just to get to know a little bit more about you. Yeah. Feel free to answer them as in depth or as concisely mm -hmm. as you feel is necessary. Okay. Okay. First question: What has been your speaking of? Performing. What has been your favorite place to perform? My favorite place. So, I had the opportunity to perform at this uh, festival called Spoken Fest in uh, in Mumbai, India. Um, so that was absolutely wow. amazing. It was like because it was a, it was a two day festival. First day was like four thousand people. The next day was five thousand people, and it's, they're all there to watch poetry. It's poetry all day. Wow! Wild because. Wow. Coachella, but poem. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, and their and their crowd is super energetic. Like, cause there's a pretty large poetry community, you know, in India, especially like Mumbai, um, Delhi, uh, Pune, and um, uh, uh, Bangalore. Um, they have pretty large poetry communities there, and a lot of their and a lot of their poets have huge followings as well. So, so yeah, like they're super about it. So, so yeah, like um, performing there was absolutely incredible. It was so many people, it was so energetic, and it was just man, it, the whole day was absolutely amazing. <laughs> awesome. Wow, I think this is like our first poet so far, or that I've known that like y'all went <laughs> internationally into something mm -hmm. like completely different than India. Wow, wow, yeah. again. Yeah. Thing to see the international communities, you know, because Australia mm -hmm. has a huge poetry scene as well. Yeah. Um, they don't have a national team tournament, but they do have a national individual tournament. Um, also, you know, the UK has a huge scene, of course, Canada, um, mm -hmm. you know, New Mexico. Uh, my, my, my family's from Belize, and now Belize is starting to have a bit of a poetry scene as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm really trying to go and do a show at some point, you know? So, um, <laughs> So, so yeah, it's really awesome to see the poetry communities in other in other places. You know, I think we see some commonalities and you know, the things that we that we speak about, um, but they're also very nuanced and also have their differences. You know, so yeah, it's always awesome to see you know um, what poetry looks like in other places, in other countries, in other regions. And it's what one thing that I really want to do because you know I run the individual world poetry slam, and once that's you know you know, comes back and becomes a thing again, you know, we're <laughs> on a hiatus right now. But once that comes back, like we're really looking at ways in which we can make it more international because you know, for a long time, it was mostly domestic. It would be just like USA and Canada, we would call it the World Slam. And it's like, not really. Kind of you know? like the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, the, the last one that we had, uh, we made a, a really, you know, huge effort to, to make it more international. So we reached out, we had a representative from Bangladesh, um, we had somebody from Spain. Um, we had uh, a few people from the UK. We had Australia. Um, so they, so yeah, we're reaching out to these like different scenes and saying, hey, you know, we would love to have you, you know, here, you know, um, at the Individual World Slam, and also looking at ways in which we could help them fund that trip because you know, traveling domestic, that's expensive in itself. But also, when you're traveling from another country, like, that's even more expensive. So we're looking at ways in which not only can we reach out to these communities and offer opportunities for them to perform at the at the at the tournament, but also looking at ways we can also help fund that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, that's awesome. I know. <laughs> <laughs> next question. I know. Okay. So let's go. Okay. So next question. Um, where is the place you feel most yourself? The place that I feel most myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it isn't necessarily a, a place, but it's like when I'm with my daughter and my nephews, mm -hmm. uh, that's when I feel most myself. You know, uh, I don't know. They just like they just bring something out of me that just makes me feel comfortable. You know, like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I, and I and it's hard for me to explain, but yeah, especially like when I'm when I'm with like my daughter. Like I don't know. You know, she's just like. I don't know. I, I, it's hard to explain it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, my daughter just makes me feel just really comfortable around her. You know, uh, she's super affectionate, which makes me more affectionate. Um, like I've gotten a whole lot more emotional since I've had a kid, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, and like emotions that I didn't even know that I had. Like one time oh my God. I'm watching this, uh, this nature show, right? And it's a nature show where this is, I forget what, what species of lizard this is, right? But they like have, they like, um, they, they plant their eggs like on the shoreline and they go inland. And then once mm -hmm. they have, like, they have to, like the babies have to like walk inland, right? But around mm -hmm. the like there's snakes who like, know that this is happening and they're like trying to eat the babies as like they walk you know into into inland and i'm like losing my shit like i can't <laughs> like, i can't handle it right like i had to cut it off but i was like man you know what i mean like I'm so emotional i was like yeah, these fucking snakes you know what i mean like yeah, but, yeah. Um, but but yeah like my daughter's brought out emotions in me that i didn't even know that i had so yeah. so you feel most comfortable around that. oh that's man awesome. i'm just like what's your sign what's this little baby sign like maybe that's why. <laughs> I believe April third. I think so. That's Aries, right? April third. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. That would be Aries. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I love that. That's <laughs> attitude. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> this is also very loving and very comforting at the same time. Oh, so <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, hardball question here. What is your favorite dish? My favorite dish. Man, I could eat lasagna pretty much any day. Hmm. Any day of the week, lasagna. Okay. I think you're the first person that we've asked that question to that was like, oh, I got an answer for this. Everyone uh, else like struggles to pick something because they're like, I can't pick just one. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's definitely lasagna. Yeah, I could say that with complete confidence. Legit. Mm -hmm. Do you, what kind of cheese do you put in it though? Are you a ricotta like lasagna type of person or no, without it or? Oh. Potta, definitely. I want all the cheeses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's at least six cheeses in my lasagna recipe. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's the only way to go. Six. Is it really lasagna? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I see no lies. <laughs> all right, all right. And then, so our final question um, for this round is what does your version of heaven or the afterlife look like? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> My version of heaven, um, man, uh, all my family is in close proximity, but not too close. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, 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 um, uh, uh, yeah, my family is close by, uh, food 24 hours. You know what I mean? I come from a city where everything shuts down at about 10 or 11. Um, mm -hmm. good food at any given time. Um, it's always basketball on the TV. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. I think those are like the three things, right? Like, hey, food, basketball, family. What else do I need? You know, so I'm gonna go with that. Legit, legit. I love it. All right. Well, we'll be we'll be back with more questions. Uh, but we want to dive into the poetry before we do for anybody that's watching out in YouTube Landia or Facebookville. Um, use the comment section, y'all. We're watching the comment section on the regular. So you can use the comment sections to just show some love. You can interact and comment on what we're talking about. Or if you have questions that you want to ask Rudy, put it in the comment section because we will get to your questions. Just use the comment section. That being said, let's go ahead and hand the show over to you, sir. And if you could please bless us with some poetry. Okay. Um, so one thing that I've been experimenting with a lot is using um, various forms. Um, one of the uh, one of the books that I'm currently reading um, is called Obit, um, and it's by Victoria Chang. And Victoria Chang is absolutely brilliant. And um, the sort of form that she uses um, 
is is an obit, right? It's it's an obituary, and it's in sort of like a non traditional way. We think about obituaries as you know things that we write for people, um, but she writes them for like the various things in her life that uh that are that, that no longer exist, right? So um, yeah, I'm gonna go with this one. Uh, I mentioned my daughter a little earlier, so this is um an obituary for me, right? Um, and what what I mean by sort of an obituary for myself is that when I felt I, when I when I had my 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 daughter I don't know I just felt like a I felt very different like almost immediately um, and I feel like you know the the a lot of things that um, I was sort of like invested in before a lot of times I just didn't really seem very important anymore because you know like I have this amazing human in my arms so uh, here we go obituary. Rudy Francisco died suddenly on April 3rd, on April 3rd, 2016, at the age of 33. The word perfect comes from the word perfecere, which means complete. My daughter came into this world the same way a sunflower springs from the earth. When her eyes bloomed, I realize that I've been an obtuse angle my entire life and things are finally coming full circle. When I, when I held her for the first time, my bones unlatched. I stashed both of my fangs and blunted my edges until smooth. I looked at her and said, all this soft is for you. I am yours. My entire chest is a morning, a sunrise, a new day. Um, and for the second obit, um, so uh, I had to help my father transition out of his out of his home uh, into a, a senior living community uh, last year, like late last year. So this is an, an obituary for my father's house. My father's house died on September fourth, twenty twenty, at the age of twenty three. An eviction notice is a lot heavier than it looks. Seems like it's just paper and ink, but it's all dead weight. Once I carried my drunk friend up three flights of stairs and I was sore for five days. But that was so much easier than putting my father's war medals into a brown box and taping it closed. I treated my teenage home like a swordfish waited for it to stop breathing and then scraped the insides. I packed a decade into a storage unit, threw away the rest and watched a dump truck take all the memories I couldn't find space for. This is a special kind of betrayal, an unforgivable treason. I don't know who to apologize to first. Um, the next two poems that, I, that I'm gonna read. So I'm gonna read probably about two more short poems and then I'm gonna read some longer poems, all right? So, um, <laughs> so earlier uh, I was asked my version of heaven, all right? So this kind of speaks to that a little bit, it's a short poem. Uh, so these, these two are odes, right? So um, this is Ode to My Mother's Plantains. In my version of heaven, my mother's plantains fall from the sky every Wednesday afternoon. It is a sweet rain with burnt edges. All the drops have been cut long ways and fried for five minutes. In the afterlife, this is the only event on my calendar. I step onto the balcony at 11.59, palms up and waiting for the showers. I asked God to put taste buds on my hands so I can enjoy each one twice. And this last one, this last ode is, um, is Ode to Summer. Uh, I've been thinking about summer a lot lately. Um, so here we go. Today, the sun decided to act all the way up, showed out like it knew we were watching. Today, the weather refuses to lie. It's been 100 all week and my sweat glands are having trouble dealing with the truth. But what I know is this, 
of all the things that want to kill me, the temperature is least likely to succeed. So I wipe my forehead, drink something cold, and I watch the sky slip into something more comfortable, something that will make the clouds wish they didn't leave so soon. All right, so, um, so this next poem that I wanna read, uh, it's called Drowning Fish. And I've been thinking a lot about like my mental health. Um, and and I've been thinking about a lot how, uh, how I often say that I'm fine, even when I'm not, even when I'm struggling and how we, how so many people also do this as well. So um, poem. During the winter of 2015, the residents of Hampton Bay, Long Island woke up to what they say was the worst smell they had ever experienced. Mysteriously overnight, a thousand fish had died in the canal. And after thorough analysis, they found that the oxygen levels in the water were too low and all the fish had drowned. Uh, upon hearing the news, many had questions like, how does a fish drown? Don't they have gills? Don't they have a fin and a tail? They said things like, aren't they built to survive in that environment? And perhaps this is the best analogy for my depression. Um, this angry deity, this jealous God, uh, this thirsty shadow that rings my joy like a dish rag, turns every conversation into a conveyor belt that always begins with the phrase, you look tired today. To be honest, getting out of bed has become a magic trick and I'm probably the worst magician I know. This sadness is the only clean shirt I have left and my washing machine has been broken for months. When people ask me how I'm doing, I wanna say my daughter's four years old and I'm still not sure if I'm a good father. I wanna say that my dad has been diagnosed with dementia. There might be a day when I walk in the room and he doesn't recognize me and I've always wanted us to start all over, but I guess you gotta be careful about what you ask for. I guess when you pray for something, you have to be a little more specific. I wanna say that, that crickets have been known to eat their own wings and I too have a tendency to destroy what helps me get off the ground. I really wanna say that I'm not in a good place right now, but that's not a polite answer. So instead I pretend it's Halloween, I jack lantern my face into something acceptable and I tell others I'm fine until it sounds like the truth. But sometimes there's a help me chain to the ankle of an I'm doing okay. Sometimes I'm fine is the quickest way to say I don't wanna talk about it. Sometimes all the oxygen in the room becomes water. I feel like I'm sinking to the bottom, like I'm, like I'm running out of air, but I made a promise to myself that I won't be another drowning fish, that I will not die in this canal. I heard that if you just take a deep breath and, and relax, the human body will naturally float on top of the water. So I breathe and I tell myself that it's going to be okay. I, I cry, but I tell myself that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because I know there is a better version of me somewhere in the future. He is staring at this moment right here and he is saying, Rudy, thank you for not giving up on us. A few days ago, I was reading and, um, I saw a run on sentence and I thought, you know, like it could have just ended right there. But it found a reason to keep going. I smiled and I said, well, same. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was like a, a really tough poem to write. It took me a while um, just because a lot of times, like, I don't really talk about my own mental health. Um, but yeah, I felt like I, I, that was a poem that I, I, that I really needed to write. Uh, the second poem, um, it's about my dad and my daughter. And I feel like it's not done yet, but I also don't know what else to do with it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it to y'all. Let me pull it up real quick. All right, this one's called Hide and Seek. There we go. My daughter is four years old, and right now her favorite game is hide and seek. The funny part is, she always tells me where to hide. She says, you go right there, I'll count, and then I'll come find you. I know, that, that's not how the game is played. I'm supposed to find a good spot, hide behind a door, a couch, or inside a closet. I'm supposed to make her look all around the house trying to figure out exactly where I am, but I don't do any of that. Um, because I know what it feels like to wonder where your father is. Thinking, I know he has to be here somewhere. I come from a long line of boys who had to pick out their own razors and teach themselves how to shave. A lineage of young men who threw footballs in the air and then watched them land on the ground. 
We are echoes in a cave, trying to love the frequency of our own noise, but have no idea where it comes from. The first time I got an A on a test, I whispered I'm proud of you to myself just so I can hear what it sounds like in a man's voice. The first time I scored a touchdown, my football coach hugged me and I said, thanks dad on accident. I've copy and pasted my father into all of my best moments and then felt guilty for not appreciating him for showing up. It's fascinating how the mind will do backflips if you just give it enough time to stretch. To be honest, I thought this feeling was a pair of hand-me-down jeans, something too big for me right now, but a garment I would grow into and then grow out of as I got older. But here I am still trying to be a father to my daughter and myself. And this is usually the part of the story when I say I don't know who my dad is. I tell you, I can look at five different pictures and not know which one is responsible for half of my DNA, but did you know that distance and proximity can eat at the same table? Did you know that a house can feel like an entire planet and silence can turn two rooms into countries on opposite sides of the world? Silence is my first language and lonely is an accent that I still can't get rid of. I was told my father left for the Vietnam War, but only his body came home and I have no idea who he was before PTSD grabbed him by the happiness. My dad is one of the many rocks that America threw at another country and eventually that country decided to throw him back but every day I saw a ghost open my front door walk right through me without flinching and my entire childhood felt like an event with no RSVPs once a friend said at least your father didn't leave you and I replied at least yours only did it once they say that an apple always falls close to the tree but if someone picks it up it'll go as far as they do luckily it's my daughter's favorite fruit so when she says let's play hide and seek I say yes when she says wait right here I say yes when she says dad you're always so easy to find. I say, oh well, yeah, I'm always right here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think I have time for one more. I'm not, I'm not sure what my time is looking like right now. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll read, I'll read one more. I'll read a short poem. All right, so this is also my last, this is also, uh, it, it's a, this is a, a, an ode. Um, here we go. So uh, it's an ode uh, to, it's an ode to the fresh haircut, right? Like one thing about, about you know, me and a lot of my friends also who are, who, are, who identify as men, um, I, when we get haircuts, it's like, the best thing in the world for us, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so yeah, here we go, Ode to the Fresh Haircut. There is something remarkable about you. Maybe it's the clean edges or the flawless lineup, perhaps the taper or the way the fade sunset blends from a number three until skin. You turn all surfaces into mirrors and we search for ourselves on everything shiny enough to hold a reflection. You're a reminder that our aunties weren't lying when they kissed us on the face and said we were handsome. You hostage all of my camera shy and make me want to be seen from every angle. Bless the harmony of the freshly oiled clippers. Bless the accuracy of the straight razor. Bless the rubbing alcohol and whatever they spray on our heads before we leave. My barber once told me as a kid, he wanted to be an architect or a magician. I replied, somehow you found a way to become both. And that's my time. <laughs> applause, 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 applause. <laughs> the virtual world we're navigating in, y'all. The virtual world we're navigating. I have so many questions now uh Absolutely. beyond the ones that we already had but i want to say before before i forget i think our next venture is going to start a youtube channel called rocky listens to poetry because <laughs> you can't see her but i can she yeah. every emotion was happening and she was expressing it <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It really was. It really was. I always tell like um, the poets. So I, I love writing notes. So I had like already five pages of just like notes while you were writing, and then I'm just like, oh my god, I'm crying, laughing, just <laughs> on my chest. So it's great. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, well, I want to start with a question that's been 
in my mind for a moment. So your uh, your first book that you published was uh, Helium. Your first full length book, right, was Helium. Um, and then this new one that you just dropped in December, ding, is called I'll Fly Away. Uh, and then even before that, you had the title No Gravity. So like, bro, what's the deal with this floating motif? Why yeah. do you hate the ground? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people ask me that question, right? So, um, so for me, writing is is it's an escape, right? Um, mm -hmm. it helps me, it helps me sort of release. And you know, while I'm writing and I'm really like focused, like like the rest of the world doesn't exist, right? Like it just feels like I'm floating, um, which is why you know I call it helium because you know helium you know allows you to defy your allows you to fight gravity but temporarily, right? Like writing is awesome and it sort of helps me sort of, you know, um, take a break from my reality, but I also have to, you know, go back to my reality eventually, right? So it's a temporary escape, you know? I think writing is therapeutic, but it's not therapy, you know? So I feel like writing for me, it, it's a way for me to sort of like take a vacation without actually having to go anywhere, you know? Um, so yeah, that's why I call it helium. Uh, you know, I'll fly away. Like all of the books are about sort of like, you know, um, uh, defying gravity, at least for a little bit. Oh man, that de definitely like reminds me a lot of like Tony Morrison. Cause when I was reading your titles too, I was like, oh, it's like very Tony Morrison-esque, you know, mm -hmm. magical realism with like, especially like Song of Solomon, right? Yeah. Where the whole motif is just flying, right? Or her quote, like you want to fly, you got to give up the shit that weighs you down, right? So you yeah. were yeah, definitely, fast. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, I I want to talk about <laughs> your poems, right? I know you mentioned that you are from Belize, and specifically for your the um, one about your mom making plantains. Yeah. I'm actually from El Salvador, so we have like I'm Central American. I was like, oh great, like Belize, and we're right there, right there, we're neighbors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I love the way that you're talking about like plantains because I feel like everyone makes plantains differently. But like for me, Central Americans, we make them the long ways. Exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. He's yeah. like the right way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got to go for a The right way, but if I had to pick one, <laughs> long way. That's my favorite. You know what I mean? It really, yeah. really is. And I feel like not that many people, um, you know, especially like within Central American writers, you know, it's still, uh, we're still invisible in this very huge, like, <laughs> literary world. So I really appreciate that. And in my mind, I'm like, do you put crema? Do you put cream? Do you eat it with cream too? I've never like, tried that before. Oh, wow. Rudy, let's like take your to the next <laughs> level. Yeah, just use like yeah, some yeah. like Salvadoran or Central American cream uh -huh. with your plantains. Like, oh, wow. amazing. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I'm gonna have to try that. I've never tried it. I've never seen anybody do that before. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Welcome to the Central American, like, <laughs> we get you here. <laughs> we'll share some recipes with you. <laughs> Definitely, I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so, so with that, does, uh, cause you, you write a lot, you do write a lot about your identity as a black man in, in this country. Does your, kind of like Latinidad in any way influence your writing, your world, this Afro-Latino vibe, or, you know, is it the opposite because you like grew up in this country as a black man, is that kind of more the predominant uh, influence in your work? Yeah, so um, like funny story, um, like growing up, like my like my parents and like a lot of like my, my uncles and aunts, like when they were raising, you know, me and, and my cousins, like a lot of times, you know, they didn't introduce us to a lot of like the nuances of mm -hmm. the culture because they wanted us to blend in, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, at a very young age, like I would often forget that I was even Belizean, you know, until, until like, I'd be talking to somebody about the food that we eat and they're like, what is that? I was like, oh, that's right. You know, like there was some, something that I out on, like I didn't have like baked mac and cheese till I was like 23, you know what I mean? I didn't even know what that was. Um, <laughs> house you know so so like there were times where i completely forgot that i was belizean um because we were sort of asked to blend in um and my parents they speak garifuna right so um and they <laughs> taught us the language because they didn't want us having issues learning english you know mm -hmm. so like, there were so many parts of my identity that I, I i just forgot about just because they weren't sort of you know enforced in me but um you know once like i got to adulthood there was a moment where I was at I was I was at my parents' house, 
And um, on one side, you know, like my uncles and my parents, like they're all drumming and they're singing like traditional Garifuna songs. Um, and in the other room, like my cousins, they're all playing Xbox, you know? And it was like, I was standing in the middle and it was such a weird experience. And I was like, wow, like there's a, there's a, we're, we're losing um, a, a part of our culture because mm. we were taught it, you know? And, um, and I just started, you know, to make a, a really, you know, um, intentional effort to learn more about my culture. And it's something that I'm, you know, putting more into my poems, like as as mm -hmm. I go along, um, just because, like, you know, I have I often have to remind myself that, like, yo, like my family comes from somewhere else, you know, just because mm -hmm. growing up, like, it wasn't enforced in us, so like, there's still times where I, where I even forget, you know. But I've been trying to I've been trying to be more intentional about it. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I mean, <laughs> I love Central American representation. I'm yeah. all about it. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that, first of all, I just want to say that I absolutely adore that you just light up when you talk about your daughter. If we're talking about family, like, I don't know, we're just like segueing because I'm just like, there's so many things I want to talk about with your daughters. I don't even know what she looks like. I, don't, I just know that she's adorable. Oh, she knows that she's adorable. Like, I spoil her. It's, yeah. it's bad. Like, my, my daughter's mother's like, you can't keep buying her stuff every day. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, what am I? What am I supposed to do? You know, like she, she points at something. I was like, all right, get it. You know, and I know this is not probably what I should be doing, but I, I can't help it. Like she's, she's spoiled. Yeah, mm. no, I think it's great to especially see like your transition of how I was introduced to you is with your your love poem. Um, it's just like to the girl from Starbucks. Oh, okay. it's like yeah. your block, and yeah. how you're like, I don't write love poems, but every time you mention your daughter, it's just like a different type of love poem. Oh, but I, I love how it's just like completely transitioned to this. I feel like a you know a dork. Like yes, I don't know how to talk about like my feelings to this beautiful person to like this amazing person's in my life, and I just only want to write about love poems about them. Definitely. Yeah. 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 She has a whole section in the new book. Like. Yeah, I write about her all the time. Initially, I couldn't because man, it was so much that I just like couldn't figure out how to actually say it. Um, mm -hmm. Like now that we're in like year four, going on five, you know, I'm finally you know really figuring out the language around it. You know, so yeah, yeah it's been just, a good experience for me. Good. So, do you like have like specific poems that you actually read to her, or do you write like poems just for her to understand, or you're just? Well, I haven't done that yet, actually. Um, I write a lot of poems about her, but I haven't written anything specifically like for her yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I want to work on though, because mm -hmm. like a like a children's poetry book at some point. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have a four-year-old goddaughter who yeah. is very much the same way. Like she knows she's the center of attention, and she oh, yeah. hams it up. Oh yeah, all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and my daughter, her name is Zoe. So she's the only um, grandkid on my side of the family. Oh no. Yes. <laughs> she's the only one. Like the next youngest person on my side of the family is my cousin Brandon, and he's like 20. Oh wow. <laughs> so she's yeah. definitely gonna be hella spoiled growing up. <laughs> yeah, there's no way around. Yeah. Like, house, when you walk in, it looks like she owns a daycare. It is like, <laughs> oh, my, like so he has two trampolines. It's crazy. It's it's too much. Yeah. It's too much. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the book, the new book. You just released it in December. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned like there's a whole section that's just kind of devoted to your daughter, and you break up the 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 book into five five sections, right? And as I was going through it, each section almost had a feel like it was just like one long poem, you uh -huh. know. Uh, and one of the ways you do that is uh, you you create words mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. don't currently exist in the English language and give them a def you know and and uh, to define something that is currently undefinable by a single word and that kind of helps like they all one poem leads into the next poem quite seamlessly. Uh, so I guess my question is about process when creating a book. What comes first, the idea for the book, or the poems, do the poems come mm -hmm. first? You notice a theme and then you start putting them together and filling in the gaps. Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So Helium, I had most of the poems already um, mm -hmm. because they're in, Hel in Helium, there are a lot more of the performance poems in there. So um, I had, I used those as sort of like a skeleton and then created poems to sort of like, you know, 
tell a narrative sort of that connects them all. Um, but for I'll Fly Away, I'll Fly Away was mostly like written like as a book, you know what I mean? So, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I wrote the poem just like, you know, as they came, like I would just write every day and then just sort of saw what sort of matched and whatnot, you know? And um, yeah, so I think with so Helium, it was like poems first, then concept. But with I'll Fly Away, it was concept first, then poems. And, um, you know, like in, in I'll Fly Away, it sort of also reads as, as a bit of a dictionary, as you mentioned, for like words that don't exist already. And that's also something that comes from, you know, my parents, like English not being their first language, you know? Mm -hmm. um, um, like my mom would always say, oh, what's the word for that in English? And I wouldn't know, you know, my, my daughter's mother, her parents are from Eritrea. Um, and so they, they speak Tigrinya and, you know, like when I'm around like her side of the family, like sometimes like her mom is like, she would say a word, she's like, but what does that mean in English? And a lot of times there wouldn't be one, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I've always just been fascinated about how, you know, at times English feels so limiting, but it's the only language that I know. Um, so the, yeah, I had to, figure out how to create new words for the things that I didn't already have language for. That's so good. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I always love just like, um, just how people are just so creative, especially like what you're saying, this like in between of us being Spanglish, but not, and like, and not Spanglish, but at least like come between two languages. Right. And it's always really hard where we're stuck. We're like, well, we know this word and we don't know this word, you know? Um, so that's, Perfectly, perfectly great. Go ahead. I'm like, Chibi, I have like five questions in the room, so you continue. <laughs> While you try and capture nice. Um, yeah. So then I guess my next question then is um, about like publishing, right? Mm -hmm. So you, your first four books, I think four, uh, were very much self-published. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had Helium with Button Poetry, and then you went, uh, you published this new one with Button also, who's kind of like primarily known for their work more in like the poetry video realm versus as a like quote unquote publishing house. Uh -huh. I guess what are, what are kind of your thoughts on or feelings on traditional publishing presses and mm -hmm. going down that route of like submitting manuscripts mm -hmm. to try and like get that to happen? Yeah. So, so for me, um, cause I had, I had known people who, who run button because before they, they were well, before button, there were, there were, a slam team, you know, um, mm -hmm. they were the Minneapolis, the Minneapolis team, so boxing. So um, I, I, I've had a good relationship with them, like since I think I met them all, I met a lot of them in 2009, 2010 ish, you know, and then, you know, when they started Button and then they started the, the publishing sector of it all, uh, you know, they just asked me, they were like, hey, like, would you be down to do a book? And at that time, you know, I had the chat books, but you know, like chat books are sort of like they're, they're low risk. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, oh, this isn't good. It's just a chat book. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, so when they asked me if I'd be down to do a book, like I was, I, I I asked them. I was like, "Do you think I could do a book?" You know. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, also, I also didn't really look at myself as a as a writer per se. Like I, I looked at myself as a performer. You know, mm. um, like a lot of my poems, like people wouldn't see them written down because I didn't even know how to format it so that somebody could read it in a way that would make sense, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, when they, when they asked me about it, like I had a long conversation with them and I was like, I'm going to need a lot of help, you know? Uh, and they were like, Hey, we can, we can give you the help that you need. You know, we believe this can work. So I, I said, okay. And they were like, Hey, send us your manuscript. And I was like, I don't have a manuscript. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, okay, we're going to assign you somebody that's going to help you put together your manuscript. And they did that. And uh, Michael Malekade, who is a brilliant writer, somebody that I have a, a lot of respect for, he was my first editor, you know, and you know, he gave me a lot of tips and I sent him, you know, versions of the manuscript and he sent me feedback. And, you know, a after it was all done, I, was, I had a product that I was really happy, you know, with. Yeah. So for me, um, like it was really, a lot of it was just networking. I had already known the people who started writing, and they reached out to me. And the yeah. reason why I went with them again, you know, is because you know, I really like the work that they do. And, you know, they have a large reach. And I think for me, uh, you know, cause I had, I had had some options on the table for different like publishing houses. And and I really wanted to go with the publishing house that was gonna, you know, that, that one was already invested in what I do, right? Yeah. Cause I consider myself to be a spoken word artist, you know? And um, sometimes publishing houses, they don't really know what to do with that really. 
but but I knew that button, you know, this is where they came from. Like they 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 know about slam, like they know about, you know, um the, the traveling poet life. They they run a venue. Um they already have a platform, you know, for video. So it just it just seemed to make a lot of sense just to go with, with them, you know. Um so that's how I chose the the public mm-hmm. that I chose. And and yeah, I've been very happy with them. And you know, I mean, there are quite a few publishing houses as well, like Not a Cult, There's Right Bloody, mm-hmm. um, I believe Haymarket. Um, yeah, like there, there are quite a few of them out there. You just gotta find one that sort of, you know, um, that you trust and you vibe with. Yeah, that you trust, that you vibe with. So you know, a a a, a company that's gonna really invest in you. You know, yeah. I think you have to think about okay, like what benefits do I get from being a part of this publishing house that I don't get publishing independently, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's the biggest thing. Because, I mean, I, even though it seems more glamorous to go with the publishing house, you know, that might not be for everybody, you know? Because, you know, when you go with the publishing house, like, you, you get a royalty check, but it's only a percentage of what you, you know, of, of, what, of what your book makes, right? Yeah. So. A lot of times, like if you feel like you can you can um, move more units than your publishing house, you know it might make sense to you know publish it independently. Just hire an editor, hire a graphic designer to you know do your covers and just release it by yourself. Yeah, like, that's also a very solid option. Well, it's it seems like it was a very uh, smart choice because it was number one on on Amazon for for a minute in what like three different categories, I think it was. So, yeah. props. Yeah. Yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah, the, the response was definitely, you know, a blessing, you know, and it was, you know, like I didn't know how many books I was going to sell when I, when I published Helium. I was like, maybe like some people will buy this, but who knows, you know? Um, but yeah, but it's been awesome. It's been a blessing to see the response. Yeah, I know that you were saying that, you know, you didn't see yourself as a performer uh, or you always saw yourself as a performer and not a, a writer. And, you know, with this whole publishing thing, I'm trying to figure out like which poem was was the hardest for you to like turn into like format in a book form or like for you to to publish? Probably, probably Rifle. I think that was the hardest one because I didn't really know much about like formatting and line breaks and you know what I mean? Like it was, yeah, and it's and it's a lot of text. So I was just like, <laughs> I was lost, you know? Um, and I had to really lean on my editor, I was like, what what should we do about this? You know, and he offered some suggestions for me. But yeah, like I think um, for me, because I, I wanted to read the same way that I would read it. You know, mm-hmm. um, so you have to adjust your line breaks accordingly. And you know, even with that, like even if you adjust your line breaks perfectly, everybody sort of reads it differently because they're mm-hmm. coming up with their own experiences, how they how they hear the words, how they see the words. You know, so um. So yeah, I think that was the toughest one, you know, just like taking spoken word pieces that are longer and figuring out how to break them up into like chunks that are very like legible that mm-hmm. don't be exhausting to read. And also like taking out like little words, like every now and then, like I would put in like a, a that that didn't need to be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, or like, um, you know, punctuation. Yo, my punctuation is not great. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I had to like look at, okay, like, where do I put a comma? You know what I mean? Like, where do I put this? Where do I put the period? Like, it was yeah, it was a whole process. So yeah, was probably the hardest one to, to to adapt to the page. Oh wow, yeah. I feel like it's poetry. That's the whole point. Like, you don't need to even have any punctuation if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> like, Bro, yeah, it. it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, that was probably the hardest one. Yeah, I think speaking of rifle, you performed that in front of Jimmy Fallon. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you're like low key poet, you know, like you're poetry famous. Like you're kind of a celebrity. <laughs> I don't know. If you know that. You're out here just chilling in your hoodie, just like, whatever. I'm just really cool. I'm like, uh, <laughs> you got to meet Jimmy Fallon because your words are like that, like popping that much. Um, which is, <laughs> again, so like brown, you know, um, groundbreaking, right? So you're like really one of the first poets to really go on YouTube, like have a YouTube viral um, video. Um, you perform in the Tonight Show. Um, you're again, Mapata is a breakthrough poet. Um, are there any of these? Are these uh, breakthroughs novel or new for your poetry? You know, uh, uh, and and they, they are. Um, you know, be, being on Jimmy Fallon was a huge opportunity. Um, 
And and I, and I definitely appreciated that, you know. Um, I got a chance to, you know, sit and talk to him for a little while. And um, yeah, <laughs> so surreal, you know. Um, but I but I also I think it's also important to understand that like, these opportunities are great, but like the next day you still gotta get up and do the work, you know. Mm -hmm. I think what happens is, you know, we get opportunities and then we're just like, okay, let me sit back and like, let's see what happens, you know? Um, but I think it's important to to know that even after these opportunities, you still gotta wake up tomorrow morning and do the work. You know, you still gotta write more poems. Like you still gotta edit the poems that you got. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's there's, there's still work to be done after that. And it's it's a great step, right? But it's not, it's not the end all be all, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like looking at ways in which you can, you know, cause it was a great opportunity, but it was like, you know, I was on there twice, uh, which is awesome. But like, at the end of the day, I'm like, I still gotta, you know, I still gotta get up and I still gotta do the work tomorrow. I still gotta yeah. figure out new ways I can book these shows. You know, I still gotta figure out, you know, I gotta write more poems, you know, like I still gotta do the work. And I think, you know, understanding that these are great opportunities, but these opportunities by themselves will not completely change your trajectory, but yeah. it's important to celebrate those wins too. You know, I think finding yeah. that healthy balance is really important. Yeah. Let's dive into that, uh, that idea of like the ca career as poetry. Cause you had a really interesting term turn in terms of a career path, right? You were, you were heavily into your academic life, uh, three years into a PhD program when you were like, you know what? Nah, fuck it. <laughs> poetry. <laughs> uh, so what, what was life at that time that like pushed you in the direction to just kind of like make that switch and be like, yeah, poetry, that's my career. Uh -huh. So um, I had started performing, I was probably a sophomore in college when I started performing. And it was just something that I really enjoyed doing. Cause at the time, like there wasn't a huge, like, I, at least I didn't know a lot of ways to make money doing it. Um, I just really enjoyed it. Wanted to, wanted to, you know, figure out ways I can get better at it. And then uh, I went off to grad school. Um, I went straight into the into a PhD program in industrial and organizational psych. And I didn't love the program, um, but I thought it was cool. You know, uh, I also wasn't trying to be an adult yet. You know, I was. I was, <laughs> an, RA. I was an RA on my campus. So I was already living there for free. You know. Um, and I was already like working for the university. Uh, so I was just like, well, I could just stay here, you know, until I figure out what I really want to do. And uh, in sort of around that time, I started getting a lot of opportunities to perform more often, you know, like, um, like I started doing well in our local slam. You know, I started going to nationals and doing fairly well, started doing IWIPs and doing fairly well. And then um, I started getting opportunities to perform at colleges. Um, Shihan, Shihan, he approached me because he was, he was my first coach actually in 2008. And uh, one day, you know, he called me and he was like, you know, how do you feel about doing colleges? Because he had just sort of started his agency around that time. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I, I'm down for it, you know? Um, and, and he was like, okay, I, I can sort of like take you under my wing and show you how to do this. So I started submitting to NACA through him. And, you know, he sort of like coached me through how to put together an hour long set. And I started doing that and I started doing that more often. And it got to the point to where I would be gone two weeks out of the month and still trying to work full time and still trying to be in a PhD program. And it just felt like all three of those things were sort of like suffering, you know, like I wasn't mm -hmm. giving my all, you know, into any one of those. And, you know, I really had to think about it because, you know, my grades were struggling. And, um, and I was like, you know, what? I love doing poetry, like in my spare time, like I'm not reading it, I'm just doing organization. So like, I, I'm <laughs> watching poetry, I'm reading poetry. And, and this is what I have a, an endless amount of ambition for, you know, and an endless amount of energy for, you know, like there would be nights where I would have to, you know, there'd be days where I have to get up at, you know, 4 a.m. That's a 6 a.m. flight, you know, and I would wake up and I would be energized and ready to go. But if I had to wake up at like, you know, 9 a.m. to like go to work, I'd be like, oh, I'd be dragging, you know? Um, and I and I noticed that and I was like, you know, poetry is what I should be doing right now. So I chose to, you know, leave my program. Um, I quit my, my job doing statistical analysis. Um, and I chose to just put my all into poetry. And, and that was, it was an interesting conversation with my mother, you know, because, you know, like my parents, you know, they moved here so that like, you know, we could have a, 
quote unquote better life and like go to school. And I was in a PhD program. So like my mom was very excited about that, you know? And and, I, and when I had to break it to her, I was just like, oh, you know, this is gonna be fun. Um, but, but when I did tell her, you know, I thought she was gonna freak out about it, but she didn't, which, you know, was awesome at that time. But um, she was just like, you know, if, if this is what you wanna do, and if this is what you love, if this is your passion, then you should do it, you know? She was like, I didn't get that opportunity to like follow my passion. Like I had to, I had to do. But one of the reasons why we came here is for you not to only have a good life, that's only have a better life, but to have the life that you choose, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so she understood at the end of the day. She still doesn't fully get it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I never do. <laughs> Yeah. She doesn't really get it, but you know, she knows that I'm doing well. <laughs> yeah. you, you you don't have to tell us about the expectations of immigrant Latinx parents. We've we we've lived we lived yeah. it. Definitely, definitely <laughs> different, right? But um yeah. But yeah, yeah, she doesn't get it, but she knows that you know I'm doing I'm doing okay. And that's you know, that's what really matters at the end of the day for her, you know. That's yeah, awesome. and I feel like you could just segue and be like, I'm still going to colleges, but I'm getting actually paid now. And so yeah, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, they're paying me to go to yes. college. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. One of her coworkers is actually a fan of my work. And it's like, yeah, she talks to my mom about me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. It's definitely interesting. Yeah, because I, I can imagine. So, um, for, for people who don't know me, I actually work in the student life or student activities area at a community college. It's like my full-time job. So we, and my, I have to do programming specifically to find like talent to bring onto our campus. So we're always associated with NACA, right? Which is the National Association of Campus Activities. And so I always wondered like, how do, how do these like people, how do these poets feel about like showcasing? Cause I've never seen poets other than in, in slam, you know, air, like spaces. And now to see them like being showcases um, at NACA was just like, wait, <laughs> it was just so weird. How did that feel for you from like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my poetry and now like mm. I have an agent or I have a, like people can book me, but I have to showcase myself like in these different NACA um, conferences, mm -hmm. you know, colleges. Yeah, it was a weird experience. I'm not gonna lie, just cause like, <laughs> Like you're you're selling yourself, you know, yes. and um, and there's like a thing called like uh, so there's there's marketplace where you're like standing at your booth and there's people coming to talk to you and whatnot, and then there's block booking where like they all sit in the room and then they decide whether or not they're gonna like bring you to their campus. So like, I I went like maybe once or twice, but it was always like a weird experience. Like like they put like your picture on the on the uh, on the projector and they're like, okay, like. Who wants them? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh, especially like being a black man, it's weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's a little auction block ish, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, like, I stopped attending that because it felt weird for me. Um, yeah. But I was in Tanaka and I was still, you know, when I got in, I would, I would showcase. But um, in the past couple of years, I've sort of transitioned out of that um, just because a lot of times when you get booked, sometimes you don't know what you're going into. Like it could be a deal, it could be a cafeteria. It could be like a multi yes. room. <laughs> It was never really my first my first show was next to a ice machine. Let me <laughs> let me tell you, as someone who has to like not only book like these like vendors, but also to book the room reservation, it's we try really hard and like <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, it was my first show, my first time doing a whole hour set. There's an ice machine right next to the stage. So people are getting ice. And it's like, uh, <laughs> there's like <laughs> where like people are ordering food and he's like yelling out orders, like quesadilla. Like, and I'm like, damn, you know, this is it's like, is this what I signed up for? You know? Um, but uh, but but yeah, like uh, because also there were some really phenomenal shows too, where you where you mm -hmm. show up and it's a full theater, there's people there. Um, but yeah, but also sometimes, you know, you would show up like and there would be three people in the audience, and you still got to do it. You know? so, um, so yeah, so like what I what I started doing maybe two years ago, uh, actually probably about three. So um, what I would do is I would just rent venues in like various cities and sell tickets. Um, so that's like what I've been doing for the past few years. Is just uh, there's a there's an app called um, yeah, what is it called? Let me look at uh, <laughs> what is it called? It's uh, oh, Peer Space. Peer space. 
it's like Airbnb, but for venues. And uh, what I would do, I would just pick cities and, you know, just book venues and then I like, sell tickets on Eventbrite. Um, so, yeah, I started doing that about three years ago. And that's sort of what I've transitioned into. Like, I still do colleges every now and then. But, um, but yeah, but that's like the, the new thing that I've been, you know, trying to spend more of my time on. And navigating that in a virtual space has worked how? <laughs> so, so yeah, so I had, to, I had to pivot again, you know, um, because I, I still do like the virtual college shows and whatnot. But um, what I've leaned more on in the past year or so, because um, I've also gotten into like the, the merchandising end of things. Like, you know, I find posters. I sell those uh, like four times a year and I sell them like 600 at a time. And that's been doing really well for me. Um, also, like the book is doing fairly well. Also, um, uh, I'm getting into like doing like crew neck sweatshirts and um, like I'm going to be releasing like a couple jackets soon. So, yeah, so really looking at the merchandising end of things and figuring out ways like I can, you know, sustain myself, but like also not really have to leave the house like that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel yeah. like if you had a Rudy Francisco like bow tie, because I know you like to wear bow oh, ties. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I, I low key was like, do I need to dress up? He always has like a vest yes. and things like that. Like, I think I need to, I think I need to dress up for tonight's show. And then the day just got away from me. Yeah. Same here. Same here. I was like, oh my God, like, Rudy's going to come here if, and then I should wear a blazer. Like, my hair should be a little better. <laughs> and then he showed up and I was like, oh my God, great. We're going to be like, just chill and all that stuff. That's great. <laughs> Rui right. Francisco is nothing if not crisp and clean, okay? Always. Both in person Always. and in his writing. Always. I try, I try, but yeah. That's awesome. Well, no, it's so great that you've been able to just kind of like navigate this career mm -hmm. as a poet, pivot as needed. And uh, obviously you're doing really well for yourself uh, and uh, in your successes. So congratulations on all of that. Uh, <laughs> Noir wants to say to inbox you whenever the sweatshirts oh. and the jackets drop. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> well, I just, I just have one more question. Um, you mentioned earlier in terms of like the way that you kind of like categorize yourself you you know like i'm a spoken word artist right that's kind of like uh was your statement um and we do this a lot right like uh rupee car is instagram poetry oh. buddy wakefield is spoken word poetry like i guess my question is do these labels even matter and mm -hmm. if so why and if not why not you know in your opinion yeah because i think I think we often categorize ourselves sort of unnecessarily, you know, yes. um, because I think there was a point where people were more just like, okay, this is what I do, right? Uh, especially when you look at like, you know, spoken word in comparison to like what they call traditional verse, which I think is more because spoken word came before, right? Um, mm -hmm. People they can write things down. So technically, it would be worse to be traditional verse, but whatever, right? Yeah. Um, we'll take the conversation we'll call you know uh the more academic written style we'll call that traditional work. so i think you know for a long period of time there was uh, a sort of um you know there's like this divide between people who did you know spoken word and people who did traditional verse and i think now what we're what we're seeing is that there there are more people who are sort of hybrids you know and there are people who do both very well and then you know like we have what we call like Instagram poetry, but then there are people who do spoken word and there are people who do, you know, traditional verse and they also post on Instagram, you know? So I think like a lot of these titles when they were, I mean, they were very specific, maybe like five years ago, but but now like so many people are are, 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 are crossing over and, and doing a little bit of all of those things. So yeah, I don't think those titles necessarily still stick, um, even though people do still use them often. Hmm. I totally mm -hmm. agree. And it's one of those things where like, I remember hearing the story about how like Patricia Smith was once introduced at a panel as the slam poet, you know, oh, and it's like, she's uh -huh. so much more than that. You know, yeah. like that would never happen these days, but this uh -huh. was a while ago. And it's like, yeah, you, it's this crossover between page and stage, right? Yeah. And uh -huh. how you can navigate both worlds and yeah. blend them. And I don't know if we need those labels necessarily anymore. Yeah, I think we often use them to say, oh no, they don't do what I do, right? Like that's what, mm. I think we often use them almost as like slurs, right? Where it's like, oh, they're Instagram posts. Cause I've been called an Instagram poet like several times and I was kind of like, ah, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, but, but yeah, I think we often use them as slurs, you know, where they're mm. like, oh, they're spoken word artists. And it's like, 
it's a way for them to say, oh yeah, they do something that is less than what I do, right? Mm -hmm. They're Instagram posts. I think they people use terms like that to sort of take you know jabs at other writers when mm -hmm. I feel like I feel like there's space for everybody and it's fine. Like just do what you do and you'll be okay, you know, you don't have to <laughs> everybody else is doing and you know saying negative comments about the ways in which people write like if you you just focus on yourself and you know you do what you do and you work on excelling at what you do and you know taking advantage of the opportunities that come your way like you'll be fine perfect i love Ooh. that all right i think that's a that's a good little punctuation on the show right so. just or no do what you do or no <laughs> punctuations right <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for this conversation, Rudy. Uh, it has been absolutely a joy to get to know you. Um, yes. If you could please just close us out with one last poem. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll do my honest poem. Like this is, uh, this is a poem that, you know, whenever I don't know what to do, this is the poem that I do. So here we go. I was born on July 27th. That makes me a Leo. Um, I don't know what that means. I'm five foot six and a half. I weigh 175 pounds. I don't know how to swim and I'm a sucker for a girl with a nice smile and clean sneakers. Uh, I'm still learning how to whisper. I'm often loud in places where I should be quiet. I'm often quiet in places where I should be loud. I was born feet first and I've been backwards ever since. Um, I like ginger ale a lot. Uh, I've been told that I give really bad hugs. People say that it feels like I'm trying to escape. Uh, sometimes it's because I am secretly, I get really nervous every time someone gets close enough to hear me breathe. I have this odd fascination with things like sand castles and ice sculptures. I assume it's because I usually find myself dedicating time to things that will only last a few moments. I guess that's also why I tend to fall in love with people who will never love me back. I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually much easier than it seems. And to be honest, I think it's safer that way. See, relationships, they often remind me that I'm not afraid of heights or, or falling, but I'm scared of what's gonna happen the moment that my body hits the ground. I'm clumsy. Yesterday I tripped over my self-esteem, I landed on my pride, and it shattered like an iPhone with a broken face. Now I can't even tell who's trying to give me a compliment. I've never been in the military, but I have this purple heart. I got it from beating myself up over things I can't fix. I know this sounds weird, but sometimes I wonder what my bed sheets say about me when I'm not around. I wonder what the curtains would do if they found out about all the things I've done behind their backs. I've got a hamper that's overflowing with really, really loud mistakes and a graveyard in my closet. I'm afraid that if I let you see my skeletons, you'll grind my bones into powder and get high on my fault lines. Hi, my name is Rudy. I enjoy frozen yogurt, people watching and laughing for absolutely no reason at all. But, um, I don't allow myself to cry as often as I need to. I have solar power confidence. I have a battery operated smile. My hobbies include editing my life story, hiding behind metaphors, and trying to convince my shadow that I'm someone worth following. I don't know much, but I do know this. I know that heaven is full of music. I know that God listens to my heartbeat on his iPod. It reminds him that, uh, that we still got work to do. So thank you so much for having me today. So great. So great. So great. <laughs> we were actually talking about that poem uh, yeah. when we were <laughs> when we were planning for today's show. Yeah, awesome. So, thank you so much. So glad you closed us out with that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was such a perfect. Thank you for for you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for being amazing. Um, thank you for sharing your joy and your your shine, especially when you talked about your daughter. I'm still like obsessed that when you talk about your daughter, I'm like, yes, <laughs> give me more, give me more. Um, thank you. I, I think your words and who you are is still a testament that it still hits. Like I'm been really trying not to cry. <laughs> it's so emotional. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for allowing my emotions to be released in such beautiful ways through your words. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, that was Rudy Francisco, y'all, joining us here on the stage. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you. You're such a Pisces, Rocky. I really am. And it's my season. <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> After all the emotions. Oh, man. No, really, really fun, phenomenal conversation. Trying to, we always like to wrap up the show with kind of like a moment of reflection and like one word to kind of like sum it all up. 
Um, I'm feeling is 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 there is there a, a noun version of genuine genuineness mm. genuinity I'm a, I'm gonna make up a word see I'm I'm just gonna pull yeah. a page out of Ruin Francisco's book and just make up a word for something that doesn't exist right now for this moment of just like the state of genuineness mm -hmm. that's 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 my word where 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 are you where are you at Oh, I feel light. I feel like mm -hmm. that's, that is where I'm at right now, especially, you know, if we're th thinking about the whole conversation, and his idea of um, writing as a way to escape, to feel lighter, to, to fly. Um, I'm right there. I'm right there. I'm, a, I'm ready to, you know, just float to this like full moon with all these beautiful words and affirmations and just emotions. And um, like I said, it's, it's butterflies, it's flying, it's being light, it's letting go of the things that weigh me down mm. by listening to him. Yeah. There you go. There you go. You too will fly away. <laughs> all right. Well, let's thank some people and fly away, shall we? <laughs> yes, of course, of course. All right. First of all, I want to we want to thank the audience. Y'all have been amazing. We see you, we see you with your emojis, we see you interacting with us. We appreciate you. We appreciate you coming out every Thursday. We if you don't know, if you're new, if you're just timing in for the first time, we do those every Thursday at 7:30 Central Time, um, 8:30 uh, Eastern Time. Um, come check us out. Thank you. We wouldn't be able to do this without you and then our production crew first of all dominique is our production crew we've always i had a we had a, like a little uh <laughs> meeting with like dominique one day you're gonna show your face so we can be like all the praise but right now <laughs> we'll settle for this and then of course chris condi for our introduction song which is bomb so thank you thank you so much and then of course whether you're tuning in for a multiple time or for the first time make sure you follow us on instagram and twitter uh at words and shh so that you can uh, be informed about everyone that's coming up because y'all, we have an amazing lineup in the coming weeks. Ooh. And if you want to, you can also watch past episodes on YouTube and our podcast as well. Um, or you can listen to even this one that's gonna be available um, starting tomorrow and any podcast that you can listen to any platform, um, but check us out. Definitely check us out and share and like send them to all your friends. All right. Mm -hmm. To your mama, to your family, to your daughters, go for it. Subscribe, rate, review us, like all those things. And uh, speaking of amazing lineup next week, our feature coming to you all the way from New Orleans is going to be the one and only frequency. So excited to have them on until then y'all stay safe out there. Bye, y'all. Have a great night.